Our guest this week on Kelman's Corner, Mark Boyle, the longtime radio voice of the Indiana Pacers. He's been at it since the 1988-89 season, and we'll be back to talk to Mark after these messages. Time radio voice of the Indiana Pacers is our guest today. Mark, before we talk about the Pacers, you have a love of baseball and you've broadcast baseball. Tell us about the experiences there. I know there have been two of them in the minor leagues. Well, I spent a full season in 2005 with the Billings Mustangs, which were the short season farm team for the Cincinnati Reds. It was a 76 game schedule in 80 days. I've done a, a number of games with you over the years. I filled in uh, one summer in Buffalo uh, as a part-timer when they played in Louisville and Indianapolis. Uh, and then I've done some Cape Cod League, which is not professional, but it's a college summer league, obviously, in Cape Cod. So I would say in the, uh, in the course of my time, Howard, I've probably done, I don't know, maybe 130 or 140 games, which is uh, the amount you do in, what, eight weeks? <laughs> well, give us your thoughts on broadcasting baseball as opposed to broadcasting basketball. Well, they're totally different. I've, I've always believed that if you can do what I call the action sports, basketball, hockey, and football, assuming you know the rules, if you can do one, you can do the other two. Uh, the same is not true of baseball. Baseball is so different. It's, it's pacing, it's nuance, it's storytelling. Uh, and that's why I was captivated by it. That's why I got into broadcasting. I wanted to do baseball, but my opportunities came in the other three sports. And so I was lucky enough to have those opportunities and jumped on them. But uh, for lack of a better word, and, and we bo both grew up in times where television was there, but it wasn't the primary vehicle. So we got our baseball on the radio and through the newspapers. And so we grew up differently. And I was so captivated by the guys I listened to as a kid. I could see those games even though I wasn't there. And I just thought that was such an amazing talent and amazing skill. So uh, to give you the short answer to that, I would say this. Assuming that you know the rules, if you can do basketball, you can do football and hockey. Baseball is a totally different thing. In my estimation, far more challenging, far more satisfying, uh, but generally just different. You mentioned the impact of radio years ago. My sister got me a T-shirt that said radio, theater of the mind. And I thought that was so appropriate. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, that, that's it. Radio, the listener is reliant on you. Television, the viewer is reliant on the broadcasters and the director and the producer and the cameraman and all of that. It's a team game. Radio is more of an individual sport. If your broadcast is good on radio, it's because you're good. If it's bad, it's because you're bad. Television is not the same. I can be the lead guy on television and be pretty good, and we can still have a bad telecast for a variety of reasons. Uh, and it's so rewarding to hear people say, this is, the, this is the greatest enjoyment, Howard, that I get out of it. Not, I like your work, although that's pleasant and nice. I like it when some up com someone comes up to me and say, hey, I was driving uh, from X to Y, caught the second half of your broadcast the other night. Man, I could see the game. That to me is the ultimate compliment, and that's what I strive for every night. That's absolutely terrific. What was it like? You mentioned being in Billings in 2005, and these were very young kids you were with. Yeah. What was that like? Well, it was totally different. By then, I had been in the NBA for, I think, 17 years, and so I was used to private jets and five-star hotels and all of the perks that go with being in the NBA. So uh, this was totally different. First of all, the Pioneer League in those days was, I'm pretty sure, geographically speaking, the most widespread professional baseball league in the country. We were in Billings. The closest opponent was Great Falls. They were four hours away. The furthest opponents were in Utah, Provo, and Orem. That was 10 or 12 hours away. So we spent a lot of time on a bus we stayed in fine hotels. There was nothing wrong with them, but they were small. There was no room service. It was just a different lifestyle. And then you mentioned the kids. In the, in the NBA, we have young guys too, but they're not making $500 a month like some of those kids were. They were our guys are making seven, eight figures. So it's a, to a totally different thing. Um, and we had 
we had some guys that had played college ball, but it was a lot of kids that had played high school. It was a lot of kids from the Dominican Republic. And it was just, it was so refreshing for me. Not that our guys aren't enjoyable, they are, but they see the world from an entirely different perspective as these kids in the Pioneer League did. And nobody ever complained about anything ever. They got on that bus, they were glad to go there. They were glad they were getting paid to play, paid to play baseball. And you know what, even with the bus rides and the hotels, I had a blast. It was one of the best experiences of my career. That's terrific. Tell us about your dad. Your dad was in the broadcast business and his influence on you. Well, my dad was in broadcasting for a number of years. Uh, when I was born, he was working in a little town called Reedsburg, Wisconsin. And as you know, Howard, uh, broadcasting is a very transient business. So before I was even old enough to go to school, we moved from Reedsburg to Fargo, North Dakota, uh, my dad then took a job in uh, New Orleans that didn't work out, but he went by himself. My mom, my brother, and I stayed behind. Then my sister was born. My dad came back, and he finally uh, got a good uh, job in Minnesota, and he stayed there for the rest of his career. He worked for a television station, which had the rights to the Twins and the North Stars. So he was uh, the evening sports anchor, and then he did games at night, uh, and he did that for a number of years. And then... Uh, at the end of his time in television, he, he was one of the first guys to broadcast games on ESPN. He did slow pitch softball and a bunch of stuff, which ESPN doesn't do anymore. Uh, and in fact, he's the answer to a trivia question. He, is, uh, he was Dick Vitale's first partner when Dick made his ESPN debut. It was a Wisconsin, I think Wisconsin Marquette. I, I'm not sure about that, but it was a Wisconsin basketball game. And so I grew up around the business and, and I benefited from that because my dad was really candid and frank. He encouraged me, but he also told me, you need to understand that you better have a passion for this because chances are it's going to be really difficult to make a living. Most guys don't. They have to piece stuff together. It's a transient business. If you have a family, you might have to move them around. There are a lot of negatives. And he made those very clear to me. I never saw those because by the time I was old enough to remember his career, he was already settled in Minneapolis. But he made sure that I knew about that. And the one thing he stressed to me was following your dream. But make sure if this is your dream, you have a passion for it. Make sure you'll enjoy it no matter how much money you're getting paid, no matter if you have to have a job on the side because otherwise you're gonna be miserable. And that was great advice. Now, I was fortunate. I, I did have jobs where I made no money when I started out, but I was single and I was a kid and I didn't care. Uh, I got, and I, you know, to this day, my first job, Howard, was making $500 a month in a small town in Montana. I was a disc jockey, a news guy, a farm. We did it all of those little <laughs> times. And then I got paid $10 a game for every game I did, which was generally high school basketball, high school football, and so forth. Uh, and I look back on that. I don't want to go back and do that, but I say this with all sincerity, and this is how I know I have a passion for it. I enjoyed that job every bit as much as I enjoy this one. Now, I'm making $510 a month now, so I'm a little more comfortable <laughs> eventually. But uh, it's, it's just the passion for the work that's captivated me and kept me going. You also said when we were talking a few weeks ago about some other advice your dad gave you about conditions and complaining. Yeah. Well, and this, and this uh, served me well also, um, you know, we're, we're entertainment, whether it's us broadcasting games, you baseball, me basketball, whether it's a guy doing stand-up comedy, whether it's a disc jockey, we are entertainment. People tune to us to be informed, yes, but entertained. They don't care if we had a bad day at home, if our wife is mad at us, if our bills are due, if whatever, they don't care. And by the way, nor should they. And so my dad said, don't ever bring that into the booth. When that microphone is live, you forget about that and do your job. Uh, and sometimes it's not that easy. You know that. You're working virtually every day all summer long. I'm sure you're tired. I'm sure you're fatigued. But you go in there and that mic goes on and you do your job. And then when the game's over, then you can feel sorry for yourself or deal with your issues. But that, that lesson that he taught me, Howard, once you're on the air, be a professional because the listener slash viewer doesn't care what your problems are. And that is, to me, really good advice. I think that's absolutely terrific. And I think the listener doesn't really care if you don't have a good broadcast location, if you can see as well as you should be able to see. I think that it makes no sense to complain about that whatsoever. I could not agree more. And in the NBA over the last 15 years, 
Uh, our broadcast locations have gotten worse because they've taken us up off of the floor to make room for more floor seats. And so we're in the corner some places, we're too low other places. Now rest assured, when we get to these arenas and we see our peers from the other teams, we complain long and loud about it, which doesn't <laughs> so good. But once again, once we're on the air, the only time I ever reference a broadcast location is if something happened that because of where I am, I can't see it. And so then I'll say, I'm not exactly sure what happened. We're in the corner here in Boston. We don't have the vantage point that allows us to see some of these things, but we'll, we'll find out as soon as we can. Otherwise, it's not relevant in my opinion. I agree completely. We'll have more with Mark Boyle after these messages. thoughts on Rick Carlisle coming back to coach Pacers? Well, his record, I think, Howard, speaks for itself. He's been very successful. He had a brief but successful run in Detroit. Then he was here for four years and did well, and his longest stint was the one he just finished in Dallas, where he won a championship uh, and has, I think it's fair to say, earned a reputation as one of the better coaches in the NBA. So uh, once they decided to make a change, then the next question is who gets the job? And it's not often that a coach of that caliber becomes available. So I applaud the Pacers for jumping on it. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how things play out as we speak. We don't know who will be on the team. We never do at this stage of the summer. Uh, last year, the Pacers came back with virtually an intact team. Other years, there are many new players. So we'll see how it plays out. But I feel confident in saying this. His track record is exemplary. And whatever the level of talent on that roster, he'll get the most out of it. Do you think a head coach in the NBA means more than a manager can have a greater influence than a manager in baseball? Well, let's throw that around because you know baseball better than I do and you've worked in the NBA. So I think you have a better perspective on it. I would say that just because you're together every single day in baseball, maybe the manager's more important because the chemistry of the group. Um, I, I always remember this. This is one of my favorite sayings from way back in the day. Somebody asked Billy Martin one time, what's the key to being a good manager? And he said, it's keeping the five guys that hate me away from the five guys that are undecided. <laughs> Which I thought was very alive. profound. Now, the strategy of the game itself is different. Baseball moves at a much slower pace. So theoretically, a manager would have more time to adapt and adjust than a coach would in a more fast-paced game. Uh, but then you've got a guy sitting next to you in the dugout with all of these charts and graphs and analytics. And it, it looks a little complicated to me, more so than it was when I grew up watching the game. I think in general, though, a baseball manager or a basketball coach or an office manager or a leader of any kind uh, some of the common denominators of success would be managing the environment, knowing what you're doing. Players can smell out a phony a mile away. Uh, you need to know strategy. You need to know tactics. But those, I don't think, are the most important things. You need to know how to deal with people. You need to know how to put your players in a maximum position to succeed. You need to be a good listener. Uh, and I would, I would say, wouldn't you, that all of those are true in baseball just as they are in basketball? Yes, I agree. It's interesting that you mentioned Billy Martin because he's a guy and he had his issues, obviously, but you put that aside for a moment. He had tremendous impact on teams he went to. The Twins, that was his first managerial job. They won the division when he was there. Then he goes to the Tigers. They win the division. They turn it around. He turned around a Texas Ranger team that were losers and they had him in the first division. Then the Yankees, Right away, they win the pennant in 1976. So he really had an impact. I think Whitey Herzog had an impact. Uh, Earl Weaver, Hall of Fame manager. However, 
you really feel that in baseball, for the most part, there's only so much a manager can do. Yogi Berra once said, look, this isn't football or basketball. There are no trick plays here. So that's why I've felt at times that even though a baseball manager is very important, that a basketball coach, a football coach might mean a little more. Maybe so, but I'll, I'll throw this back at you. It's something that my old partner, the late Slick Leonard, used to say to me. Uh, I asked him early in our relationship, say, uh, how much difference does a coach make? And he played in the NBA. He coached in the NBA and the ABA, so he had a good perspective on it. And he said the coach does make a difference, and this is true in every sport. He said the coach does make a difference, but let me tell you something. I ain't never yet seen no jockey carry a horse across the finish line. <laughs> and he always would call players hossies. If you don't have the hossies, he would say, it doesn't matter how good you are. So to me, the mark of a good coach or a good manager would be, did you get the maximum that that group <laughs> had to offer? Some groups in baseball could win 100 games. Others would be lucky to finish 500. The mark of a good coach slash manager, I think, is not how many games you win, but how you max out your personnel. Here's a note that came to my mind on Earl Weaver years ago. I have great respect for him. He's a Hall of Fame manager. But did you know that there were four times in his career he was in a deciding game, and he lost all four of them? The World Series in 1971 and 79, the League Championship Series in 1973, and the final day of the season, Baltimore-Milwaukee tied for first place in 82, and Milwaukee wins the game. So that goes under the classification. You can only do so much. Yeah, you could, you can. And then plus you're talking about, uh, not literally, because these were the concluding games of series. But when you get to the concluding game, you're talking about a one and done. And sometimes right. chance comes into play, injuries or whatever. So I would tend, at least for me, I would tend not to judge a guy based on a game seven, but rather the broader picture. I agree with you. Now tell us what it's been like. You started working for the Pacers 1988-89 season. And I believe strongly you should get the Kirk Gowdy Award for broadcast excellence in the Basketball Hall of Fame. But tell us about working for the Pacers all these years. Well, first of all, let me thank you for that. that. That's the highest honor in our business, and I appreciate you saying that. Uh, here's what I didn't understand, and I think probably nobody who's young understands when they start. My goal was to get a major league job. I wanted it to be in baseball, but my opportunities presented themselves in other sports, and so I pursued them. Now, when I finally got a major league job, this is what I didn't understand that I do now. These jobs are not all the same. You can work for a great organization or a terrible organization or most likely something in the middle. Uh, I was so fortunate when I got here. I signed a two-year deal, Howard, and uh, it was one of the smaller markets in the league. I already worked in New York and St. Louis and Minneapolis. I'd been around and I was grateful for the opportunity. But I figured I'll stay here for two years and then I'll move on to something bigger and better. Well, there are things that are bigger. but it didn't take me long to realize that there can't possibly be a better place to work than this. We have great owners. They're the longest running owners in the NBA. They've owned the team since 1983. Uh, so we've had one ownership group in my time and an ownership by the way that respects people, hires good people and allows them to do their jobs, which cannot be underestimated. Number two, I've had two bosses in 33 years. We've had three different men run the basketball program in 33 years. In other words, they hire good people, they value continuity, and it's an outstanding place to work. So I lucked out in that regard. I talk to my peers around the league all the time, and I'm not suggesting that Indiana is the only good place to work, far from it. But I hear horror stories about some of these other organizations, um, and I can't decide whether I admire my friends for sticking with it or feel sorry for them for not bailing. Um, you know, if you don't have good bosses, you, you know this, you've been with the Indians longer than I've been here, and they've had the same ownership group the whole time. You, you get the idea. Uh, good ownership, good management is invaluable. Uh, and I always say this for me. The ideal job, and these do exist, but they're rare. The ideal job is one where you feel grateful to have it, which I always have. I've never lost sight of that. You feel grateful to have it, and you get the sense that they feel grateful to have you. Normally, it's the employee who's grateful, and sometimes the owner doesn't care, 
or the ownership is thinking, man, this guy's great. And the employee is looking to leave. Um, but rarely does the employee appreciate it and be grateful for it. And the employer feel the same way. And I felt like I've always had that here and it's just been a great place to work. I think that's beautifully said. I also think you get in a situation where if you're not working for great people, they can sit there and pick at anything you say if you want to. Yeah, this is an art, not a science, and there's no one way to do it. So if I want to, if I want to tune into an Indians game, I'm pretty sure I could find 30 things if I had a mind to that I didn't like, and you could do the same to one of mine. That's the way it is. It, it's not two plus two equals four. It's very subjective, and it's an art, not a science. And so if somebody wants to tear you down, they can easily do it. On the other hand, if they want to support you, they can easily do that, and it's much appreciated, and I've had that here. Mark, thank you so much for joining us, and congrats on all you've achieved over the years. Well, I appreciate it, Howard. It's always a pleasure, and I'll throw that back at you. You've been with the Indians now, so it was, was Cobb still with the Tigers then? I, I, <laughs> what's the, the 1909 World Series with the Tigers and Pirates. You know? <laughs> well, anyway, your, your success has been noted by many and appreciated by all, and I, I'm, uh, I'm glad you had me on. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark, and we'll be back with more after these words. guest Mark Boyle. Next week, another guest from the world of sports. Goodbye, everybody.